Um, what I'll do now is introduce Tim O'Connor. Um, Tim is a principal process engineer with over 30 years experience in design, commissioning and operation of treatment plants. Tim specialises in activated sludge processes and uh, for wastewater treatment and is familiar with a wide range of technologies and uh, approaches to effective treatment. Tim has a vast body of experience across water, wastewater and recycled water infrastructure projects and he has been involved in large scale wastewater treatment plants uh, such as the Christie's Beach wastewater treatment plant upgrade um, and has recently led the process design elements for the Murray Bridge wastewater treatment plant project. So if you welcome Tim. Good morning, everyone. Um, this morning's presentation, I'm just going to take you through probably some of the, the key aspects of the, of the uh, engineering elements associated with uh, this project. Um, probably deserves even a greater platform if we're talking about all the specific areas of the, the project, but it'll give you an appreciation of the, the features that uh, uh, Chaz talked about, but I suppose I'll talk about more of some of the engineering aspects associated with it. So pump station 34. So this is the pump station located at the existing treatment plant site. Um, what you see in front of you is, is a 3D model um, of the process. We have a conventional uh, wet wall arrangement uh, with um, odour control, uh, three dry well submersible pump sets, um, with this station can pass up to about 140 litres a second as, as the maximum wet weather flow. Um, passing that um, through a uh, pipeline out to pump station 33. Um, some of our engineering challenges around this area was uh, odour. It wasn't until we actually got through the odour modelling work that we found out that the odour complaint, or sorry, the two odour units wasn't really on top of the hill. Um, like Near, near the nearby residents. It was actually further in the township because of the topography of the area. Um, so the vent stack um, that uh, emits the final treated um, odour, we had to raise by another three metres. So that stack's about 15 metres tall. That overcome the issue of the two odour units. And that was about, about a one kilometre away from the site. So strangely enough, you think that the residents closest to the infrastructure would be the ones that would likely be complaining. No, it would have been further in the township and they would have said, what's, what's going on? Why are we now smelling stuff that I've never smelt before? Um, this pump station um, fully replaces the existing treatment plant um, standalone. So there's no other associated infrastructure uh, that's been used within the existing plant. Some of our um, other thoughts and liberation around this pump station was reliability, um, operability. Um, to the point where these, these pump sets, so the xylem um, drywall submersibles, they have the ability to, to reverse direction, reverse flow. So we're looking at um, uh, detect, auto detection of uh, ragging events that occur in the pump set, and then the pumps then go through a routine to then stop pumping, reverse rotate, self clear the um, impeller or the associated suction line, and then start up again and away they go. Um, the existing plant has a macerator which takes the debris in within the wastewater and kind of shreds that to improve the, um, the characteristics of the wastewater but also to lessen the maintenance headache. So that was obviously another deliberation in the back of my mind when we designed this pump station. It has three offtakes in the wet well um, and across the uh, pumping cycle every pump unit will operate at some time during uh, the day or of course over two days just to ensure that the wet well uh, debris is managed properly. Uh, odour control um, is based on a biotrickling filter with um, activated carbon. Um, in terms of uh, we're running up to about 15 air changes per hour. So again that was also demonstrated through the odour modelling work how much negative pressure we needed to maintain within the uh, wet well to manage odours immediately around the uh, pump station site. Pump station 33. So 33 is a booster pump station in two sensors. Um, the three sets of pumps are the wastewater pumps uh, ready, um, working on variable speed drives. 
Um, and the other two furthest pumps are booster pumps, effluent. So the same pump station has flows running in two different directions. On the wastewater side, we normally can pump everything from pump station 34 all the way up to the treatment plant. So from an energy minimization point of view, uh, these pumps basically sit there and only under peak of dry weather flows, wet weather flows, do they actually operate. Um, the, there's no way to control at this um, pump station because it's a fully enclosed system. Um, and the effluent booster pumps uh, I'll talk about on the return journey in terms of flow. The treatment plant site. So today when you come to the site visit, um, we'll be, the site construction offices are up here on the left hand side. There's a viewing platform that you'll be able to look straight down the middle of the plant. Um, you'll see the construction of the um, MBBR tanks and the lamella clarifiers. Uh, but this, this, I suppose, overall site plan gives you an appreciation of, I suppose, how compact the site is. It's, it's not a very large plant. Um, but uh, in terms of getting your bearings of where things are at, uh, you have a main access gate coming in. There's a liquid waste receiving station uh, for tanker trucks to unload um, outside the treatment plant. Um, then within the treatment plant, uh, there's the main inlet works um, you know, through here, which is your initial screening uh, through three millimeter screens. And also within the wastewater then flows into an aerated, uh, water, uh, aerated grit tank, serving two functions to remove the grit. But this plant also has a fair degree of fat sores and greases coming from beast and foods. So that process then allows that material, the fog, fat sores and grease to float to the surface, which we then skim and remove off that process unit. Um, flow then moves into the MBBR process, which I've got some other slides to show you what's going on within that process, uh, through to the lamella clarifiers. So this is a high rate um, clarification process through effluent disc filters, which were then removing suspended solids. And then the flow moves out into two large um, in-ground um, earthen line storage tanks. So again, you'll see those two tank structures um, today um, with the, and the, um, the main concrete tanks. Um, as part of this um, system is a sludge management system. Now, this plant's a bit unusual compared to the other SA water sites in that this site is not actually processing sludge in terms of breaking the organics down to stabilize it. All it's doing is holding the sludge. So there'll be two sludge storage tanks that get aerated for management of odors. Uh, that sludge will then go through screw press machines to then dewater that sludge to about 18 to 20% solids. Um, into a storage silo located here. And then a truck then comes in through from peat soils to then pick up that material um, every second day or so. And then they take that out into their composting operation. So that composting operation, um, which is in uh, Brinkley, then they incorporate that with the rest of their green waste and predominantly chicken carcasses from a lot of the processing factories um, up in the region to then produce a composted material. So um, the relative, relative contribution of that sludge with respect to their total operations is minuscule. So that then allowed SA Water to say, well, let's not overcapitalize on infrastructure that's needed on this site if that sludge can be beneficially used in that composting operation. Um, also on this side is uh, alum that's used in the clarification process uh, to help with the settling of the solids. Um, and also we've got polymer that's also going into that process. Above that um, is the admin building and the main switch room for the, for the site. Um, beside it is UV disinfection. So as part of this process, there was a need to achieve a one log removal for viruses. Uh, that's all been attributed to the UV disinfection primarily because we've got a very short sludge age in the MBBR process. And 
uh, the way the flow man works its way through the plant is all via gravity into the storages and the effluent transfer pump station works on a constant flow rate. So the storage is allowed to buffer the dynal variation in flow. And then the flow we took in yesterday becomes the flow set point that that pump station then returns that flow back out to the army wetlands. So simplistically, that's kind of all the major elements um, that uh, make up this treatment plant. Now to go into a bit more specifics, a moving bed biofilm reactor. So <clears throat> for this site, we have two trains, each handling about 100 litres a second each, two compartments within each train. So the picture you see in front of you is just a typical representation of one treatment train. The first zone deals with the organics. So we're removing the BOD that's in the wastewater. And the second zone is where we polish, finish removing the BOD, and then we partially nitrify the, the wastewater. In other words, we're, getting, we're converting the ammonia to nitrate. We don't need to do the full nitrification process because the effluent standards, requirements, didn't demand that. Um, why do we select an MBBR process? Because it's footprint, energy consumption, robustness. So once Beeston Foods uh, contributes about 40% of the organic load to the plant, and that's quite variable depending on their production uh, regimes across the year, that kind of naturally left, 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 led us to drift towards this technology. Within the tanks, there's media. And within the media, on all these inner surfaces, is where the biofilm grows. That allows us to provide that resilience in terms of keeping the biofilm within each of those zones. That in its, it's not physically that size. That's 12 millimetres wide and 12, metres, 12 millimetres long. Uh, we hold up to about 45% by volume as media. It's about, round numbers, half the tank volume is full of this media up at design. Um, and then, you might, then we have to hold the media within the tank. So the middle picture shows you um, the screens that are located on the baffle wall. And the media comes up and hits the screens and that's what stops the media migrating from one tank to the next. Um, Suez have in also included a, um, a back flushing system using air to then agitate pass air across the screens just to keep the screens generally cleaned and media free. On the floor of the tank, you see that this is where air gets introduced. So the air just sits down on, within pipe laterals on the floor, not, ac not actually through the floor, but um, that's the diffuser. It's a coarse bubble diffuser. And you might say, well, how do we get the energy efficiency we're using a coarse bubble diffuser compared to fine bubble? It's the media. So the, the diffuser releases coarse bubble, low head loss. And because of the volume of media we've got in there, the bubbles have a lot longer contact time before they actually hit the surface. And that's where we get the oxygen transfer. And that's where we get the energy minimization from, from the blower energy. High rate clarifier. So this is the next process unit on. So we've, now we've done all the treatment of the water. Now we want to remove the solids from the wastewater. So our first step is to, we head into a, a rapid mix um, chamber where we've uh, introduced um, alum um, the, uh, with a certain contact time. We then move into a flocculation zone where we add polymer. So here we're now starting to stabilize the flock that's been developed and make it heavy enough so it can actually settle in the settling chamber. So then the flow moves into the settling chamber and we have lamella plates near the surface, which is what you see on the right hand side, where the water is, is, uh, migrates up at an angle through the plates. And then we harvest the clean water off the top of the tank. The heavier solids sit on the bottom of the tank, which we remove periodically. After the lamella clarifies, um, we go through um, effluent disfilter uh, uh, filters we primarily included this because if we wanted to lower the solids concentration coming off the clarifiers to improve the performance of the UV disinfection system. So from the clarifiers, we'll have somewhere between 20, 25 milligrams per litre suspended solids. 
post the disc filters, we're down to five. So this is a physical barrier process, being able to capture all those solids, which get returned back to the process. You may be able to see this in the stockpile yard today, because uh, they're actually on site, but not installed. Uh, next step on is uh, we go through into the storages. The effluent transfer pump station draws the water out of the storages to return it back to the wetlands. Then we then go through um, UV reactors. They're actually the Wetico LBX units. Um, they're dosing up to 58 millijoules per centimetre squared to give us the one log removal. So they're also, it's a validated system um, to, to, to vet that it's actually can achieve that dose rate without having to go through on-site um, testing. And that's where I kind of finish. We're going to do the return trip though. The, the Sorry, the, uh, the return trip. Um, Sorry, I was too. That's it. So on the return trip, so we're coming out of the treatment plant. Uh, overall length of the pipeline is about 10 kilometres. Um, we come back via this same pump station and then we go through the effluent booster pumps. So depending on flow regimes, uh, the effluent booster pumps can then turn on as required to then provide some extra energy to get the flow all the way out to, to the wetlands. Um, so all, the pumps, all the pump stations run on variable speed drives to kind of manage um, flow regimes that are going through um, each of the pump stations. But for most cases, pump station 33 is really just there for top end flow conditions um, and therefore would only sit in like in an idle state under all other real types of operating modes. So it's kind of where we've looked at engineering, sizing of pipe work, pump selection, to try and come up with uh, the lowest energy kind of whole of life cost. It's kind of driven some of the design solutions uh, uh, for this. Um, in terms of, um, we've talked about some control aspects. Uh, these same booster pumps have the same ability to detect uh, blockages. Um, coming through the, uh, through the pump sets. Um, not so much of effluent, because we're basically devoid of any material that's in the pump sets. Um, but this plant is designed to be fully automatic. Um, it self-regulates um, and only will dial out critical alarms to on-call operators to say, hey, I'm in trouble. That's where I'll leave it. All right, thanks a lot, Tim. If you join with me and thank Tim.